discussion is to look a bit at the current discussion on, on big data, um, which seems to be coming a really a dominant paradigm in, in the study of mind and brain. And to contrast that a little bit with the objectives of, of the field we're, we're advancing in this conference of living machines, right? And it, it's also to, there might be an apparent contradiction here in what we're trying to do in this community and how science is moving in, in a more global perspective. So the idea is that, that the panel members that I list here, that's Roberto, uh, Mark, Andy, and Ricard, um, they will join me later on stage, but then sort of to, to frame a little bit the issue, I will, uh, I will say, uh, say a few words about that. And, um, and that's also to sort of raise a number of the issues that I think we should, we should debate here. So um, this is an example of the most complicated kind of technology that hum humans can put together. Um, and these are really highly complicated machines, right? And in some sense, if you look at other flying machines we're gonna hear more about later in the week, um, there are still many things we have to improve, we have to learn. And in one of the things, one of the sort of, the, the angles we take in this community is that we say, well, maybe looking at the brain, we can sort of advance our understanding of engineering. We can improve the, the machines we built. We can address complicated problems of scaling and integration and so on. But it raises the question, what's, but what's then this methodology to get there, right? So if we, if we want to start from the brain, uh, packaged in this form, and we want to get there to these sort of robots of the future, what is this bit of miscellaneous magic in between? Um, and a, another complicating factor here is that the brain is a multi-scale system, right? As opposed to many systems that we engineer, where sort of you can restrict the levels of description to a rather limited number, Brains are organized at levels that go from nanoscale, where we have molecules interacting, forming, let's say, ion channels and so on, to, let's say, the urban environments and the culture that brains, as a collective, can construct. Okay, so this seems to be a very unique aspect of this challenge. Now, if you would just take a bibliometric approach to that, and let's say you say, okay, let's, let's plot all, all the publications that we have collectively reviewed and put out there in our collective database, it should look pretty good, right? It's like 22 million publications since the 1950s in the domain of life sciences. So in some say, well, we should know, we know a lot, right? So in that sense, it should actually be not so difficult to crack that nut. Um, and these papers, these publications, of, then also reflect the data that's being collected. So an example of, of how that is evolving, we see here, uh, it's by a paper by, paper by Mattman from, from last year. So the standard encyclopedia of DNA elements is about 15 terabytes. Um, other sciences uh, are incrementing that with quite a bit for climate research. Um, but soon, and actually there's another circle here in the background, you see only a little bit of it, that's a square kilometer array that will spit out huge amounts of, of data per year that all has to be apparently stored and analyzed. So that's sort of illustrating this big problem that we're facing of big data or the data deluge. But in our, fa in our domain, the big, the 800 pound gorilla in the room are the Human Brain Project in Europe and the Brain Initiative in the States. If you, if, if our question is, okay, the route into the future is looking at the brain, then this seems to be a, an at, a promising avenue as advertised by luminaries like the American president. Um, so, but the point is, if you look at this in a bit more detail, the prophets of the Human Brain Project would talk about bottom-up modeling. This, let's get all these details together and then we put it in a big database, we turn on the computer and Jesus will be reborn. Okay, this is the promise. If you talk to the representatives of the American Brain Initiative, they will tell you, well, we actually don't have the right technology to get data. We have to invest in getting better technology. So you see that we're having a challenge here, let's say, okay? And 
what the future looks like is this. Does anyone know what this is? No, no. And actually, you're partially right. This is paid for by the American taxpayer, and it's a data domination room of the NSA, okay? <laughs> and the guy in charge of the NSA is a Trekkie, so he wanted to build it like, like a Star Trek uh, control room, okay? But he calls it the data domination room, <laughs> okay? So you know what that means, right? Because it means we're gonna collect all this data and then we're gonna dominate the data, right? Then we're gonna send in Team America, okay? And Team America's gonna dominate the data and then Jesus will be reborn, okay? So that's a problem, all right? So this is the issue we'd like to discuss. Where are we going with that, okay? And in my opinion, and I will be quick on this, if you look really at where we are now uh, in our study of the brain, we actually are in a very, in a, in a regression of our understanding, right? We started with consciousness. It became the empty organism of behaviorism, uh, strongly committed to scientific methods. Uh, then it became the disembodied mind of artificial intelligence. And there was a little here, a little uh, offshoot towards cybernetics, which died. And since the 90s, we are in some sort of metaphorical biology. Right, where we not really study biology, but we study our inspiration of biology, whatever that means. Then it became the brain, and now that is forking off into big data. And what we're losing on the way is our science, because effectively it means that we give up on theory, we give up on ideas. Right, so big data, in my opinion, this is what I would like to see discussed, is that we're sacrificing our scientific model. Right, the scientific model that goes back to the person who used this stick here, which actually was a telescope, which is a friend Galileo, right? And Galileo, as soon as he heard about the telescope, he thought, ah, that's great, because I have an idea. There's something like a Copernican model of planetary motion. And now I have the instrument with which I can test, through my observation, that theory. But it all starts with the theory, right? So from, from the theory, I can deduce my observations and then from these observations, I can, I can induce advancement of my theory. I have, a, I have a cycle of empirical science, and in between that, we have the magical a creative component of abduction introduced by Charles Sanders Peirce in the 19th century. So that means we, there is an idea of a scientific model. We all know since, since the 1970s, we cannot claim that there's one scientific method, there are many discussions on this, but there's something like a, a, a scientific process. And big data seems to be willing to sacrifice all of that in sort of nihilism about just collecting bits of data, all right? So the question I would like us to discuss then is, uh, and I invite our panel members to, to join me here, is, Okay, does this mean that in this field of biomimetics and what we're trying to do here with living machines, we're barking up the wrong tree? Do we also have to sort of connect more closely to our friends who are accumulating data? Or are we facing a possible collision between these approaches? Okay, so this is like the kind of question we'd like to debate it. So if um, Roberto, Andy, um, Mark and Ricard would like to join me here. That would be great. Do we have a handheld microphone? Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's Tony. Ah. Okay. I'm told I can use this one if you guys don't give the right answers. To him. Okay. This is. Everyone. Okay, gentlemen, um, I hope the question is sort of comprehensible. So, Andy, tell us about the future. Well, uh, you get your money's worth, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We have a data domination room. Yeah. Well, first, I'd like to uh, basically agree with your general premise that I think these initiatives seem to be uh, asking for black magic. Um, on the other hand, uh, there has been a long history of brain theory and the lack of data. And I think they're, they're an experimental uh, support. I, I would say so. So I think 
there has to be an effort to um, have well-directed experiments that directly um, link with theory. There needs to be a, a tighter interaction. Um, so I guess that's what I would say. Um, All right. No, 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 no. Mark, you want to add to this or disagree with Andy? Or? Uh, uh, just a couple of thoughts. One, one is I really liked your picture of the NSA gathering big data. You know, they may very well have a hypothesis, only it's classified. They will be the last to hear about it. But, you know, the funny thing about big data is, on the one hand, so 17,000 mechanoreceptors in the hand. We're not even close uh, in robotics. Um, the only area where we're starting to get a little bit close is in vision. So on the one hand, we, 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 we have this terrible paucity of information, actually, in robotics. It's not very big data. <coughs> And the other thing is that as we do start to gather data, as we start to um, gradually overcome that paucity, we're going to have to find very, very good ways of ignoring most of, of the data. Um, there, there are studies that show in an audience when somebody's talking, the average attention span of people is about seven seconds, and then your brain goes off and starts thinking about other things, and then it comes back again. We, we, need, we need models of all that, because as we start to get, so in short, as as we start to get anything even approaching big data, and we're not there yet, we're going to have to find really good ways of ignoring most of it. Oh. Um, well, my point of view is more on you know, solid state, basically, solid state electronics. I, I think that the robot today makes some um, 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10 binary operation per second, and it could grow by three, four orders of magnitude in the next 10 years. A human makes 10 to the 18 operation per seconds on a, a normal human, maybe you, I don't know, uh, more, <laughs> more. <laughs> no, no, I want to say more. <laughs> so uh, as a matter of fact, um, this corresponds to a petabyte operation per second in a human and less than terabyte operation per second in a machine. So in the short term, I think the only solution will be to have a, a good 5G, 6G communication protocol, like this is 3G now, it's going to be 5, 6G, and then a cloud, which will be the repository of the global intelligence of the machines, and that could fix the problem for about 10 years, maybe five, seven, I don't know. But in the future, um, I think we should approach the problem of massive computation in a totally different way. You cannot definitely make uh, 10 to the 18 operation per second by using silicon, because a single CMOS operation would cost 10 to the minus 7 watt. So, to have 10 to the 10 operation per second, you need uh, 10 to the 11 watts, so a power station for a single robot. So it, it could not be electronic, it could not be silicon. And I think he said something very interesting today. Um, when you want to play with electrons, uh, with circuitry, you have to face the problem of resistivity, home law, these things. When you play with biological systems, uh, cross-talking means basically that you transport mass, you transport ions. So the circuit has to be liquid, there should be water, ions moving, totally different uh, computational infrastructure. I think we are uh, struggling to make much better with silicon, but in 15 to 20 years, if we want to imitate nature, we have to go to ions. So forget silicon, and therefore the cloud will not be useful anymore. Okay, I'll be more, maybe more generic in my, my comments. I have to say with this very strong light, I want to confess, but I don't know what, what, yes. what to confess really. Sign the paper. Yeah, I will, I will. <laughs> no, I think, I think that this, uh, here you're, we're discussing this, uh, the part of the story about neuroscience, but there's, uh, I've, been, I've been experiencing on, or suffering, whatever you want, over the last decade, this omics thing. In, in my surroundings, you know. so many people saying I'm doing bioinformatics, metabolomics, um, et cetera, et cetera. And it's great that we have good data to kind of look at reality in a more detailed way. But very, very often I find, and especially I find people uh, that is doing the PhD, for example, who came and say, what are you doing? Well, I'm building this enormous database where all the information of, about these and blah, blah, blah is going to be there. So then I ask them, what I learned, in particular, the Santa Fe Institute, what is the, the core of the being, being a right scientist, which is, what is your question? What do you want to understand? If you don't have an answer to that, you're not doing science. You're doing something wrong, really. And the, and the huge data thing 
it as it as it comes more and more sale and the big data I know I feel kind of uncomfortable with that I think that we are really losing track of what are the real questions and and especially when we, we talk about understanding what do you mean by understanding that that's that's a different story my students when I for example I show them um, how to make a model of a problem for example, how, how uh, viruses decide that they, they insert themselves in the genome or instead uh, blow up the cell. There's two, two pathways. How do you understand that? There's a very simple Boolean model that shows you that this is a switch. In that respect, that's the explanation, the logic explanation. If you're going to, if you're going to go beyond that, you want to think about therapies, for example, of course, you have to do it for more detail. But there's no more understanding really about the logic of the process. Right. And I think we are really losing track of that. But then to follow up on that, I, I see that there's no consensus yet here on this podium on whether we actually have enough data or the right data. Because I, I feel that, so some of you are saying, like, like Mark and also you, um, Ricard, that there's not a massive need for data. The market that you have said that explicitly, right? We've got to sort of worry about what we got to throw away. But, but just to finish your question, well, Andy was saying more something like, well, we hold these theories without data. And I don't necessarily agree with that. So maybe we can try to resolve this. So, so Ricard, do you believe you have enough data right now in your hands to advance in your field? Or do you really f feel like, oh no, I need, these terabytes of data to make progress? No, I, I, I don't think so. And actually, maybe that's, that's one of the, the lessons that you, you take, uh, at least from physics, uh, from, from ideas of like universality, emerging phenomena, that very often the understanding of the, pro the problem at a given level does not require the details on the lower scale. So the, all the data related with those details might be completely irrelevant, depending on what you are asking about. And, and it's a lot of examples of that, a lot of examples. So, uh, Andy. So, one way I like to think about this issue is that um, we always, when we see something strange like the brain, we always try to relate it to things that we understand. So, uh, and, and this venue is great for that. So, we understand machines from basic principles. And what I mean is that we can construct machines with discrete parts and pieces. Each piece has a functional consequence. There's a causal chain that's very clear. Um, and, and we assume that the brain is like that. And when the anatomy, when we first started studying the brain, when, when uh, you know, the, the first anatomy experiments, they cut open a brain, they look at it, and they look at the ventricles, and they go, well, these ventricles are very clear. That must be where the soul is located. It must be liquid. It's filled with liquid, and that's how the soul works. And then beyond that, they would cut and they would say, oh, there's a black spot in the brain. We'll call that substantia nigra. There's a red spot. We'll call that the red nucleus. Uh, there's wrinkles in the brain. In front of the one wrinkle means one thing. Behind the wrinkle means something else. And what that means is you're assigning function to structure. And there's not really any basis for that. And, but if you look at all neurology and all neuroscience, that's how we think of the brain as working, that there's discrete parts, locationism, each piece has a specific part that's different from everything else. And the reason we're comfortable with that is because we understand that from machines and computers and circuits. If you look at all these brain initiatives, they all talk about circuits, maps, etc., because we like to equate that with machines. What if the brain doesn't really work that way? You know, what if each piece is pretty much similar to every other piece and there really isn't that much difference between pieces? How will we begin to understand something that's built like that? And I think those kind of fundamental questions are a lot more difficult than just saying, well, we're going to put everything in a database and solve the world that way, or we're going to come up with new engineered techniques to address, uh, to make more tools. I think where we have to start is uh, with deeper thinking. And to me, and I think a lot of us, that seems to be what's missing in uh, what we need to do in order to go forward. Okay, but um, before we get too dismissive about big data, I, I, one of the things that having more data lets you do is it lets you discover patterns that you simply couldn't see before. And everybody in the room here who started entering anything into Google search, there's that sort of scary moment where you realize it's pretty well anticipated exactly what you were looking for, even if it was something that you thought was pretty esoteric. And 
I am in the interesting situation right now that most of the little robotics and not so little robotics companies that I've worked with over the last 10 years, Mecca, Boston Dynamics, uh, they've all been bought by Google. And one of the questions is, why did Google need to do this? Well, one of the hypotheses is that they've decided they can no longer rely on you and me to gather all the data they need, and they're just going to have to go out and get some of it themselves. Maybe Google was purchasing all these companies because in the next 10 years, the forecast is to have few billions of robots around. And so instead of having one billion humans on the, on the Twitter and Facebook platform, you have billions of robots on another platform and they make more money. I think this is the only, the only reason why Google has purchased all the company. And this somehow goes back to what I mentioned before. I mean, in the short term, I think we will have so many machines having a very poor intelligence, uh, but you don't want to switch on and off every day the machine and you know, switch off and in the morning after you want to switch on and re-educate the machine. So you need a big cloud and this is what Google wants to sell, you know, where all the experience and intelligence is, is there, you switch on your little robot and it works. For the next 10, 15 years, this is going to be the business. The point is, it's already old, um, so we have to go well beyond. But for now, it's like the car. You use benzene, you have four wheels. I mean, this is the architecture, silicon. So, with that, to, um, so, so I think overall that we, we see questions around the, this whole big data movement, okay? So I think uh, it's not necessarily that, that we have necessarily exactly the same opinion on where this is going. But then, then the question becomes, okay, but um, where does it leave a field that, uh, let's say an emerging field that we're in, right? Because that means the, power, the powers that be are very definitely playing the big data game. So uh, certainly if you look at the big companies like Google, Facebook, and so on, if you look also at the big publishers, they play the big data game. And also if you look at the funding agencies, they play the big data game because big data is something you can understand, right? Because now you can suddenly pose a question about, oh, this is all very efficient, right? Because we're storing all this data that's being collected. So you see there, there's a collusion of, of let's say, all these stakeholders in what we call science. But in the end, maybe leading to a set of values for scientific research that violate what science is about. So where does it leave an emerging field like this? So what's your prediction on that? Do we have to, let's say, raise our voice, make more noise and say, look, this is now the revolution. And then what is that revolution about? Or is it, do we, should we take a position where we say, well, this is like business as usual this is a political reality that we just have to adjust to. So how do we now maneuver through this, through this terrain? Where do you see a field like this end up five years from now, also in the face of these big, these big collaborative projects like the American Brain Initiative and the slowly crumbling Human Brain Project? So I think you know, we can look a little bit to the recent past and try to gain some lessons from that. And you, you know, I think the... A good example is the genome project in the U.S., where the, you know it was being sold as as soon as we had all the genes, uh, the day afterwards we'd cure all disease, and there was a big race on that. So it was Francis Collins and NIH gobbling up a large amount of, of funding, and, and then there was Craig Venter who had a little side company that was blowing the socks off them, and he had a completely different idea. He said, you know, you don't need to uh, deterministically deterministically go after every gene, you could use a, a, basically a random search statistics and, and get at it much faster. And uh, the, the good thing was is that he had the opportunity to do that. And so you allow innovation to happen. And you can even say the same thing with the space race now. You know, For years and years, NASA was pouring in billions and billions of dollars to, to do things. And then when they opened it up, you know, SpaceX is, is up there in a few years, four years, right? And they're already, uh, you know, have a superior product. So I think whatever they do, you know, government tends to an announce these big initiatives, but they have to make sure that they allow the little guy, uh, you know, the, the noise in the system to spring up and actually come up with good ideas once in a while. I, I'm not sure. Maybe we should be getting ready for the third, or is it the fourth great disappointment of AI? Um, right. 
I, it may be that this current sort of, we're, we're, we're sort of pushing this idea of gathering huge amounts of data and then statistically searching for patterns and that, that will kind of go as far as it can take us and, and at which point people will be looking for something else. If we want to be well positioned, yeah, if we have really good models, good theories to push forward, we should start to do that and, and, and be poised for, for when the third or fourth disappointment comes. Well, I believe that in the short term, uh, there is very little to do. We have to see what technology uh, proposes us. In the long term, maybe we should start thinking highly interconnected systems uh, with ultra-low power consumption. I mean, I believe this is what should make the difference. And in order to do this, uh, I think we should, we should be ready also to accept another failure. Look at the quantum computation. It was a complete bullshit, but people tried. So maybe in the future, there will be another. Yeah, but, but Roberto, you seem to be saying, like, well, maybe we shouldn't sort of get blinded. Maybe we shouldn't get blinded by the big data discussion. We should just let these guys be, but we should refocus also our considerations on, let's say, computational hardware uh, substrates and so on. And that might be then the way through this challenge. Is this really the implication of what you have? So what do you expect from me? Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Right. So, Ricard, how do you see this well, next step? I think that we have we have to openly show our our criticisms. I agree that it's not like saying let's put down big data. It's, it's, not, it's no need for that. But I, I do I do believe that there's a is a draining of talent of people that is going into that. And I I, I don't think that this is something we can we can ignore. Yeah, but look, you guys are so mellow about this, right? You think you're old. <laughs> now look, the point is, so I was, I was trying to tickle you, right, by actually making the point that for me big data is at the end of a long regression in a study of mind and brain where we really gave up and even tried to understand anything, right? We just say, look, who cares about theory? That's too tiring. Let's just do this mechanical thing. Let's just get this data. We're safe, it's easy, it's well defined. The administrators think we're really efficient. The publishing houses are so happy because there's lots of stuff we can now put out there, uh, uh, open access, right? So the, the, everybody's making money, so everybody wins, all right? But what, I'm, what I was saying is that it actually signals a deep crisis in our science. So I feel that, that we have to be very careful, saying like, well, okay, it's fine, let these guys be. And then at some point in time, we, we will sort of emerge again out of this swamp. Because maybe there's no way back. If we have critical mass in this, in my opinion, very nihilistic approach towards science, we have eliminated what science is about. We have eliminated ideas. It's like a new dark age. Who says we can come out of this? I will, yes. This is the... the too pessimistic. Too pessimistic. Things and uh, let Google and the other people to play with the big data. I don't see the total regression. It could be useful in some respect. So I just say that uh, it's a bit pessimistic as a vision. Uh, I don't like so much the approach of big data, but I think it could be useful. Let them work and we invent something new uh, 20 years ahead. But the problem, I think, if I can, if I can say something, is that uh, yes, let, let, let them do things. But um, I see more like uh, political decisions behind that, lobbies that have been successful in, in, in pushing this forward. And it's, this, this is not a great time for finding good funding for, for science. And, and I'm not saying that this is the bad science and there is a good science. Well, yeah, I'm saying no, that. No, you can say but, that. But, but, yeah, well, You've been well, saying that the whole yeah, day, the hell, the hell, yeah, <laughs> in, in the They're end, all politicians, you see that? <laughs> No, but in the end, it's, it's things that, that you, you see that often and often again. I, I, I was in a, in a, in a talk uh, a while ago about proteomics mm -hmm. done by Luis Serrano, who is in principle one yeah. of the big shots in the, the area. And he was being very, very critical about that, mm -hmm. saying that, you know, if for a student doing a PhD, it's not difficult going into the omics to publish four papers in journals that are supposed to be okay. Mm -hmm. 
but then he was showing uh, examples of things that do not tell anything, that they are done mm -hmm. with this big data and you have pathways and everything. Mm -hmm. You don't explain anything. Sure. But in, in the middle, you find little spot of things that are really surprising, but will require going to the standard biochemistry, go to the lab mm -hmm. and do the standard experiment. But of right. course, you don't publish five mm -hmm. papers. Exactly. So yeah. mm -hmm. what's going on with that? Okay. I think you guys are too polite. So look, uh, my lovely assistant, Tony, will, will now take the microphone and, and, and dance to the room to uh, give you all a chance to, uh, to, to perturb the panel members. So. I, I just finished a book uh, that is Science for Dummies, and they were talking about three types of data, so uh, big or small. Uh, the first type is uh, a record, a trace of a process that is going on. For instance, paleontology is studying the traces of biological evolution. And that's useful as a data for a, a scientific approach. Then there is uh, data, big or small, that is the result of an experiment. For instance, um, the CERN, when they're trying to measure the Higgs boson mass, he's producing terabytes mm -hmm. of data per second. But it's uh, an experiment. It's been designed to produce a data that contains an answer. And then there's a third kind of data, which is called noise, and be it white noise or colored noise. And what you get there is if you have bullshit in, you get bullshit out. Mm -hmm. That's just the things I've learned reading Science for Dummies. Very good. No, but, so, but another element that I think you also illustrate in this way implicitly is that there's no such thing as pure data, right? The experiment is constructed. It constructs the information we extract, if you want, from, from reality. And often th there's a hidden assumption in these big data projects that there's something like pure, a pure nugget of information you can extract from the universe. And that's not necessarily true. So does anyone want to further react, react to this? Well, well, I will. The, the problem is that a lot of the time, you, at least when working, maybe this is the engineer in me speaking, the designer. A lot of the time, we don't know what the right hypothesis is or what the one is that we want to put forward until after we've built something and acquired data and looked at it and started to get the glimmering of an idea. And then, of course, it's, it's great. You, you write the paper after the fact. You write the paper as though you started out with a hypothesis. You built a prototype and gathered experimental data that confirmed the hypothesis, and have, we've completely inverted the order. So, um, so what I guess I'm trying to say about that is that um, there, there are times when just looking at data that might initially have appeared as noise um, leads you to some interesting conclusions. Uh, I'd like to make a comment. So uh, I, I think you're right that uh, Often looking at uh, the world and trying to understand it and describe it before you try to understand it is the great approach in science. What's interesting is how many of the best journals have, you know, for years now said, oh, we only publish hypothesis driven research, uh, which is going against that uh, approach of let's describe before we try to understand. And big data may be taking us back towards that. But I, I worry, actually, it's, it, it is what Paul describes as a bit of a, a capitulation. Uh, that rather than saying, okay, let's collect data, uh, let's, let's collect observations and then try and find theories. This is more, let's collect observation in the hope that somehow theories will bubble up out of this process of data collection. So uh, it's not driven in the same way by scientific inquiry. I think it's, it's driven by hope. Yeah. So, um, I would also, before people make comment, uh, I'd ask you if you could uh, say your name if you're making a comment in the audience and point out that we're all being recorded. I know the panelists knew that. Mm -hmm. And that uh, we might put this on the Convergent Science Network website. Absolutely. Later. Okay, so mm -hmm. over here was the next. So I'm Sergio Solinas. I work in Italy at the University of Pavia. Um, I would like to point out the fact that uh, there is very little funding for theoretical development, a pure theor theoretical development. And normally, if you want to propose a new idea or develop that, you need to have a, a background a, a lab that collects the data in order to prove that idea. So you always fall back in the, in the fact that you need a lot of data or big data in order to validate it. 
and there is no uh, open calls to develop new theoretical ideas or new languages to, to f have a framework for uh, uh, new, how can I say, to, to, to construct mm -hmm. a new theory of how a piece of a brain works. So it has to be always connected with uh, uh, data. Mm -hmm. Or the question is, are you aware of any uh, funding that uh, would uh, support this kind of process? Um, there are, I think, two subheadings in the new U.S. Brain Initiative. If you look at the final product, they actually address that a little bit. They at least make noise that theory and computation are important factors in going forward without saying, you know, there's no clear programs that address that, but at least they, they state that in, in what they really want to do. Right. Also in Italy, IIT is supporting good ideas in, uh, in science. Roberto, you agree? There you go. So, uh, but then of course, keep, keep, don't forget that at the European level, programs like FET, Future and Emerging Technologies, or ERC, uh, European Research Council, has been supporting, has been very supportive, I think, of very much idea-driven research. However, when you start to focus it more towards neuroscience, indeed, it becomes a bit more difficult. I, I would agree with you there. Um, other questions? Tony. Ah, yeah, thank you. Uh, Mandiam Srinivasan from the Queensland Brain Institute in, Austra in Australia. Um, what worries me about doing this massive data collection is that quite often we have no idea whether the data we're collecting is appropriate or not. I mean, it really depends upon the hypothesis, doesn't it? I mean, you could be serendipitous and lucky and find some correlations of patterns that make you say, aha, but are we really collecting the right kind of data or not? That's a big question we have to ask ourselves. And two examples I'd like to quote where people have collected massive data. One is, of course, the C. elegans, where they've looked at the 302 neurons and, and looked at every synapse, every axon, every dendrite. They know the circuit well. But has it led to any new, terribly new novel insights? We are not sure yet. I mean, could we have done just as well without knowing that, that the detailed property of that circuit? Again, at Janelia Farms, you know, Howard Hughes Medical Institute is doing the same thing now with Drosophila. Massive serial sectioning, looking at every neuron, every synapse. Is that, is that going to lead to something really new or different? It, maybe we should stand back and look at that to see how that works before funding a huge, massive project right. to look at the human brain in the same way. Well, the, the last example, just to add to that, I was having a discussion with him about their approach to serial sectioning this uh, Drosophila brain. And he was very defensive and very sort of proud of what they were doing. And I asked him, but are you actually able to extract the gap junctions? He said, gap junctions? We're not worried about gap junctions, OK? So there you go, right? Because you know in these brains, gap junctions are key in, in intercellular communication. So if you miss the gap junctions, you actually have no idea what's really going on. Yeah? So this is a massive problem. So this is really that indeed, I mean, given our measurement technology, the, the kinds of correlations we can extract from the universe is practically is infinite, right? So if you don't Im impose constraints on that, you can get lost very easily. So anyone wants to add to that, that remark? <laughs> okay, there's a confession. We have a confession coming from Andy. Well, um, you know, the, again, there's this big dichotomy in neuroscience between uh, anatomy and function. And I think one of the important things to remember, and I, I think most of these projects are, is that the uh, dimension of time is missing. So you can look at all the synapses to a cell, but of all the synapses, 99.9% .9 of them are silent at any given point in time. So the real question is, is how much just identifying connections is maybe a, uh, you know, a necessary factor, but it, it really isn't the important factor. Um, Sarah Bird Breiter from the University of Maryland. Um, this kind of reminds me, this, I didn't know there was such dislike of, of big data actually, but I think the insight can be gained from a lot of different arenas, from theory, from big data, from experiment, as was mentioned. Um, it reminds me a lot of the discussion in the controls community in the 1950s, when you were first separating theory from experiment. And in fact, if you go back and look at uh, the 
proceedings from these conferences, they actually have transcripts of discussions like this. Mr. So-and-so says blah, Mr. So-and-so says blah. Never misses, by the way. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so the, uh, this discussion was, if you completely remove the theory from the actual real life scenario, can you gain any insight on that scenario? And I think these days all of us would agree, yes, you can still gain insight on that. Um, but there is another point of view that you still need you know, those experiments. And I think what we've discovered through that particular experiment is that you can get insight from both the theory and the practice. And it really comes down to big data. I think maybe you can discover patterns that you just don't see otherwise. You know? And I think that might happen. Whether it's worth the funding that goes into it is another question. Um, but I, I still think big data has a pretty decent place in this. You know, so thing. you're clearly a nice person, right? So, um, but but the point is, you, you can apply the 60% rule, right? If you throw money at scientists, there will always be some sort of impact for about 60%. That will be your your return on investment. But the question is, is that the best route forward? Okay, given the problems we want to solve, and I think what 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 we also hear from in this panel is that with this example of the Human Genome Project, in retrospect, even Ventner and the NIH guy, I forgot his name now, um, Kaus, um, they admit at the end of the line, there, they, there was a 10-year uh, Human Genome Project uh, special in Nature, I think, two years ago. They admit, we actually didn't achieve what we promised. Okay, so that, that raises this issue of the 60%. Would there have been a more efficient way to make progress on disease, because it actually had zero impact on disease? And now we see with the Human Brain Project, people play the same game. They would say, oh, we're gonna cure Alzheimer and autism and schizophrenia and all these things. Just give us all your money and then we will cure you, okay? And we'll give you the fountain of youth. But the question is, is there not a better way to get to that point if we just adhere a bit more to the theory, right? So th I think the 60% rule we have to consider critically. thing about the theoreticians in the 1950s, people who were doing the state space work, they said, you're just doing, you're just putting letters down, it has no relation to what I'm trying to do at all. And so they thought that was throwing money away. I don't know enough about big data and brain science to be able to argue either way on this, but it just seems that patterns could emerge from this that would be useful. So, uh, Ricardo, do you have, no, okay, I think we should, uh, uh, end the discussion there because we can continue it over a drink. Um, I'd like to thank the panelists and our chair, Paul Bushow. Thank you very much.